Bonjour, good morning. Uh, my name is George Smitherman. I'm the president and CEO of the Cannabis Council of Canada, a national industry organization for licensed producers of cannabis. First off, I want to wish everybody a happy fourth anniversary of the legalization of cannabis, which despite the many challenges which we might focus on, was a very significant action of the government and the Parliament of Canada. In May, we came to Ottawa for our Grass on the Hill event, and we signaled that there were significant challenges in the industry which needed urgent attention. We brought forward five big asks, which started with ask for help towards becoming more financially viable as a sector. We, re we return not that many months later to a much more dire circumstance that is facing much of the regulated cannabis industry in Canada, putting a lot of the gains of cannabis legalization and the significant investment made by producers and processors of all sizes at considerable risk and risks to the communities, which in many cases they've played a role in revitalizing. So we come to Ottawa to seek urgent attention to the matters at hand, and we bring practical solutions to the many government players and parties that we will participate with over the next couple of days. I'm so pleased that representatives of the cannabis industry from across our great and vast country are here today, and I'll be pleased to uh, invite each of them to come forward and offer their perspective on the challenges of today's legalized cannabis environment in Canada. Thank you. Thanks, George. Roger, hello. My name is Dan Sutton. I'm the CEO and founder of Tantalus Labs. This is my 10th year in the Canadian cannabis industry, starting from medical cannabis. I'm also the founder of a movement called Stand for Craft, an organization representing 40 small to medium enterprises, micro cultivators, and independently owned and operated small businesses across Canada. It's no exaggeration to say that unfortunately, all businesses of any size in the production and processing side of the cannabis industry today are systemically absent income. This is an industry that cannot pay its own bills and cannot make ends meet. The root of this issue stems from an overly burdensome financial obligation towards excise tax, regulatory fees, and cost of compliance, a cost of compliance that is not borne by our largest competitor in this market, the illicit cannabis industry that has thrived in Canada for the last 50 years. This is a competitor that does not bear costs associated with lab testing or quality assurance. It can deliver within 20 minutes to any city and town across the country. And we are here with no short of an emergency crisis ask to reevaluate and reassess the way we tax and burden our small businesses in this country in cannabis and hopefully to provide a brighter future for them so that they can continue to build the back of this industry in small towns and cities across the country. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, George. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity. Firstly, my name is Mark Ripa, and I'm the owner and founder and president of AB Laboratories located in Hamilton. Uh, we've been a licensed producer for now six years, just went through our um, renewal with both Health Canada and CRA, and uh, one of the early earlier licensed producers uh, from tw uh, 2016. Uh, I would like to just stress a little bit further to George's uh, point about urgency. We had a grass on the hill six months ago, uh, and at that time we were in an urgent state. Although we spoke uh, to a variety of government officials, the past six months has created a further uh, urgency and quite frankly, has put our company in a survival mode. Uh, we're a company that is a producer that is selling all our product in the provinces, but are burdened by excessive uh, excise tax implementation at the time of regulation, uh, 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 reg I'm sorry, of recreational uh, legalization four years ago. Uh, the price of product at the time that the uh, excise tax was established has dropped substantially, all the, although the excise tax itself has stayed the same. Uh, 
we just current or just uh, recently finished a year end in our excise tax and our regulatory fees of 2.3 percent represented 40 percent of our top line revenue uh, uh, in this industry. It's unsustainable. The sad part about this is now companies that have found their way in this industry and are doing everything right are in a position where and I'll speak for my company, are prepared to throw in the towel. We can't make a profit or even making make a living with the current excise taxes. Uh, on a point of urgency, uh, we believe it's now for the time for the government to act. We cannot wait for an 18-month um, process uh, of going through and looking at what's happened in the market over the four years. Our industry leaders know what hap- has happened, and there's virtually a few items that need to be dealt with immediately. Excise tax was supposed to reflect a 10% revenue uh, of sales. It's now representing 40%. Uh, the 2.3% uh, recovery fee should be uh, literally abolished immediately until the mandatory review is uh, taken place. We don't have 18 months left for a bureau, uh, for the for the industry to look at the problems that have already been established over the, uh, the, the the last four years. Quite frankly, so urgency for us has gone far beyond that. Uh, urgency. There comes a point where companies cannot continue to operate and st- uh, sustain their uh, performance under the conditions that we have to do. So we need the government to address it immediately, look at it, come up with some options, possibly a moratorium on the fees until the mandatory uh, review are completed. Uh, but at this point, that is one of our major asks in in our uh, in our industry. Uh, appreciate it, and thank you for your time. Hello, my name is uh, Myrna Gillis, and I am the CEO and founder of Aquilitas. Uh, we are located in Brooklyn, Nova Scotia, and uh, I have been in the cannabis industry since 2014. We also represent a number of craft growers uh, through our uh, current collective. Uh, one of the things is we know we're here today on the fourth anniversary of of legalization. We are also here close to the anniversary of the closure of the Bowater Mercy plant where we make our home today, uh, where hundreds of jobs were lost in our rural community. We fast forward 10 years and we're still 150 jobs shy of of meeting uh, the renewal of what was lost in our pulp and paper industry. And the cannabis industry uh, really breathed life into that community. And we've replaced uh, approximately half of the jobs that were lost. We don't have another 10 years to rebuild our rural economic uh, base in in communities uh, and in provinces like Nova Scotia. If we go, it's more than likely, you know, that that it'll take another 10 years just to get back to baseline if we ever recover it at all. The taxes that we have and the administrative fees are de minimis to the operation of government in affecting meaningful policy or economic programs. But they are life-saving to small and medium enterprise businesses like Aquilitas. So for us, you know, just by illustration, that administrative fee is seven jobs. For us, that 10% is the difference between us being able to service our debt and have more opportunity to get more capital to expand and grow our business even more to recapture those other 150 jobs. It is not uh, alarmist or chicken little of any of us to be here today. We have been fighting for this industry and we have been fighting for access and now we're fighting for our survival. We would urge the government to take a call to action to preserve the gains that have been made and to recognize a quick solution to adjust the things that are holding us back. Thank you.
Bonjour. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Pierre Leclerc, président et directeur général de l'Association québécoise de l'industrie du uh, cannabis. Um, très heureux aujourd'hui de nous joindre à nos amis et collègues d'un peu partout au Canada. Merci à George uh, Schmitterman d'avoir organisé uh, la conférence de presse uh, aujourd'hui. Um, ça fait un peu plus d'un an maintenant que je suis arrivé uh, à l'Association québécoise de l'industrie du cannabis et force est de constater que les piliers, les prémices et les principes initiaux de, de la légalisation à l'heure actuelle euh, sont en voie d'être... Euh, on est en voie, enfin, d'échapper de, 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 euh, aux dix euh, principes. L'industrie à l'heure actuelle, quelle qu'elle soit, que ce soit sur les marchés publics ou les compagnies euh, privées en ce moment, sont à peu près tous à peu de choses près, à peu de choses près dans la même situation. C'est un sentiment euh, d'urgence et de nécessité de considérer l'industrie sous une perspective économique. Donc, que ce soit le thème d'assises, la taxe d'assises, euh, que ce soit l'incapacité d'avoir accès à des programmes et mesures euh, gouvernementales, que ce soit le fardeau réglementaire qui est un des plus élevés au Canada, si on veut que la légalisation réussisse, on se doit d'avoir une industrie pérenne, une industrie qui pourra être rentable et une industrie qui jouera son rôle, bien entendu, d'offrir des produits de qualité à la population de façon très responsable. Donc, aujourd'hui, on va se joindre à nos collègues du Canada et demain pour faire entendre notre voix auprès du gouvernement fédéral pour qu'ils prennent leurs responsabilités. Ils doivent agir dès maintenant, avant la révision de la loi. Il y a beaucoup de choses qu'on peut accomplir tout de suite, notamment jouer son rôle sur la scène internationale, nos entreprises ont besoin d'être accompagnés, ont besoin d'être considérés comme un secteur économique au même titre que tous les autres. Et euh, par simple équité, l'industrie doit avoir accès aux mêmes programmes, mesures. Merci beaucoup. I'm going to switch X. <laughs> <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'd be very, very happy to uh, take uh, questions. Just one small note. Dan Sutton is from British Columbia. So we've got uh, coast to uh, coast to coast. Questions, if at all? So we'll start with the questions in the rooms, and I'll come out with the questions in the room. Those of you who are joining online, please use the raise hand function to notify us of your question. S'il vous plaît, utilisez la fonction levez la main pour poser votre question si vous êtes en ligne. Good afternoon, Stephen Jeffrey from the Lobby Monitor. Uh, you did mention that earlier this year you had the uh, Grass on the Hill uh, Lobby Day uh, raise some some of these issues. I, I guess with um, with the coming week, are there uh, sort of particular new tactics that you're planning on using to get the attention of parliamentarians, uh, continuing conversations with parliamentarians from earlier in the year. Um, I, I guess, what's what's the uh, strategy for this week? Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, and uh, thanks for the work that uh, that you do. It's uh, uh, very informative for many of us. Um, first off, as an example, we did this event, Grass on the Hill, which is designed to try and bring the regulated industry to meet with elected officials and political staff. We did it in May, and we're back now. It's bigger and more people have organized meetings with their independent members of parliament. So if I've been as a former politician, I've been conveying to our industry that the adage all politics is local is a very real one and been encouraging people to make relationships with MPs. So that amount of activity is enhanced for sure. And we have 13 or 15 delegation meetings tomorrow with political staff, one or two politicians, uh, but in all of the prime ministries or departments that have influence uh, that have influence over us. So we're certainly seeking to try and build up the advocacy capacity and therefore the influence potential of our industry, which is found everywhere across the country, uh, but many folks in, you know, quite a quite a challenging circumstance to draw people away from their day-to-day -day jobs to focus on lobbying and regulatory activity in Ottawa. And from that, those earlier discussions, ongoing discussions that there have been with parliamentarian staffers, is there the sense that uh, folks in Ottawa are grasping the, the seriousness of what's facing the industry? I'd like to hope so, but I would also be clear to say we have a long way to travel. And I think that um, uh, the, the work that we did in May uh, was important because it started to create baseline levels of awareness about our sector in some departments, which ought to be important to us, but actually having kind of looked in on us. I could use agriculture 
as an example of a department, obviously we're growing a high value added crop that's counting in a variety of agricultural statistics, but would stand as an example of a department where we could certainly benefit to have more uh, support and encouragement. So those are examples of the kind of delegation meetings that we're having on top of individual companies meeting with their local member of parliament. Uh, but the urgency message is the one that we're really seeking to call for. In particular, we've had a year late the launch of the statutory review. Now, it's a broad scope, which we're pleased with, and it's a very excellent leader in Morris Rosenberg. But we can't get that year back. And as these folks have made the point very well, the, the urgency of the matter and the underlying fiscal vi financial viability of most people in the licensed sector is really at risk. Thank you. We'll now move to online questions. If you have a question and you're online, please use the raise hand function. If you have a question that you are in line, please use the function of the hand. First question, Sean Terry, please go ahead. Hi, George. Um, I just want to, uh, it, it might go without saying, but if you don't mind, expand a little bit on the significance of the impact on the uh, cannabis industry in Canada overall with respect to the operations of cannabis retailers, the Canadian consumer, and the continuation of the illegal market. Uh, I'll do I'll do my best and anyone else could chime in on their uh, take on it also. Here we are at the uh, fourth anniversary where we've seen an industry uh, that's uh, contributed more than $45 billion in gross domestic products, supported at least 150,000 jobs through a big expansion factor and supporting something in the neighborhood of 50,000 jobs every day in uh, every day in Canada and really emphasizing the extent to which the license holders can be found in all of the regions of Canada with a lot of rural economic development along the lines of what Myrna spoke to. I think that in a certain sense, like I'm super proud of the work that uh, many license holders have done to offer the Canadian cannabis consumer uh, an array of products, but in some circumstances, we run up against product format limitations like the 10, million, 10 milligram limit on edibles, which is a very significant barrier to being able to win back that category from the legacy markets. So that I think that um, the other point is Dan made it very, very well, is that uh, in a circumstance where we come out of the box with a very, very high tax, uh, markups at the provincial distribution level and a regulatory burden, which everybody knows is pretty intense, how do you compete with people in the illicit market that have none of those barriers? So this is really what we're up to. And what does that mean? The public health objective of legalization is at risk. That was getting Canadian consumers to consume products that have been tested and to get business out of the hands of criminal elements. And it's very, very clear that that priority uh, needs uh, to be put to, to more urgent attention because our capacity to eliminate the illicit market in a circumstance uh, where we're up against it on the fees, taxes, and regulatory burden is uh, pretty much impossible. Anyone else on this? Do you have a follow-up, Sean? Uh, no, I'm great. Thank you. If anybody else has a question online, please use the raise hand function. Si quelqu'un d'autre a une question en ligne, utilisez la fonction levez la main. The next question, Steve McKinley. Go ahead. Hi, George. Steve McKinley from the Toronto Star. Um, just to reiterate, what exactly overall is it that you're asking from the government in terms of taxes, fees, um, crack down on illicit to uh, illicit to uh, market. You know, just touching the illicit market piece, like you're a reporter from Toronto. I live in Toronto in the riding of Spadina, Fort York, where we'll be meeting with the member of parliament. We've got 24 hour retail cannabis shops that are illegal operating without any seemingly without any enforcement attention whatsoever. So that's one example of kind of, uh, uh the enforcement, uh, you know, and that we'd be looking for. 
Uh, at the heart of it, you heard here that the excise tax, which was projected at a dollar in ten, is coming in at a dollar on three fifty, uh, and it's really elbowing out the prospects for regulated producers. We have seen our price degradation over the course of three or four years be extraordinary while the taxes hung in exactly where they were, only raising the proportions of the overall product that are into tax. But we know reform of the excise tax is challenging and that the finance uh, de minister, deputy prime minister, would need to work with provincial colleagues, etc. We're calling for urgent attention to get working on a fix for that, but recognizing that that's not something that can happen quite in uh, quite in uh, an immediate basis that uh, the government can move forward with a moratorium on the tax on a tax on a tax uh, that they use to recoup the cost of running their bu bureaucracy. It's 2.3 percent. It's not the whole deal, but it is a bottom line operational impact that would, uh, if a moratorium was offered on that tax, would offer firstly a sign of encouragement and secondly some immediate relief for license holders across the country who are very much struggling to meet all of the tax commitments that they have. And just one last point on this. The, the smoking gun, if you will, the canary in the coal mine, call it what you want, is already here in the government at CRA in the form of a list of the cannabis license holders who are not able to keep up with their CRA obligation. And that list is a growing list. And that list is a signal of the growing urgency for more immediate attention. Georgia, yeah, please. Thanks. The question asked, what are we looking for? In my view, the first piece of acknowledgement that is critical to setting in forth the motion to make change that will provide industry fundamentals of survivable economic viability is that the original excise tax calculation was based on an assumption of a $10 per gram wholesale price. This wholesale price has never existed. It didn't exist in the illicit market. It never existed in any legal market. $10 per gram in Canadian dollars doesn't actually exist at the wholesale level in any cannabis jurisdiction in Canada. We don't actually need an acknowledgement. This is a self-evident financial truth. Looking back on four years of industry data, where wholesale prices started in an undersupplied market at around $8 per gram, and now are easily below $4 per gram on average. Until we recognize that that excise assumption was based on limited data and a miscalculation, we will not be able to move forward to create an excise program that allows for long-term taxation maximization, ultimately, bringing in the most revenue feasible from a self-sustaining and functional industry. And that's the first step. Thank you. Follow-up, Steve? Um, just to clarify... Um, George, you were talking about a moratorium. Um, what's the moratorium on exactly? Just clarify that for me, please. Dan was speaking to the structural problem that exists with the excise tax, which was premised on a $10 gram that doesn't exist, and we've got that locked in. That, uh, we agree, needs immediate attention. Uh, Health Canada has a different tax that they apply to us of 2.3%. Uh, and we uh, know, because we saw for a brief period in COVID, that they have the opportunity to stop collecting that tax. And what we're saying is we need them as a first sign of awareness of the urgency to instate a moratorium with respect to the collection of that tax, at least pending perspective that they might gain from either the statutory review process, which has been launched recently, or the industry strategy table, which they've initiated and that is coming to life. So we've put a signal around that 2.3% regulatory tax uh, at Health Canada because we know it's within the government's capability to move rapidly to offer uh, some form of relief uh, with respect to introducing a moratorium. Next question, David Brown, go ahead. Hi, George. David Brown, Strat Can. 
Uh, given the dire nature of the industry uh, with the high rate of taxation, could you give an estimation of how many companies in, say, the next uh, 14 months uh, you would estimate might go under due to this high level of taxation? You know, David, you know a lot of these uh, full complement to you from your work in British Columbia with a lot of uh, producers. So you know the story very, very well. I, I hate like it just shakes it just shakes me uh, to even think about a projection of the number of companies that might be lost. But I sure have talked to a lot of companies in the last week or two that told me two things. Firstly, don't expect me to be around for a fifth anniversary if the current circumstances prevail. And although I wanted to come and be with you in Ottawa knocking on doors, I'm here struggling to find, try to find capital to keep the wheels turning in my existing business and meet the payroll obligations to my employees. So I hate to guess, uh, David, I could say that, like I mentioned before, I think people should look to ask the CRA, what's the data look like right now? Because as I understand it, about half of all of the cannabis companies that have a number, a CRA number to send funds in are behind on that. I'd have to say that's a very, very bad leading indicator, but just how tough it is out there. I don't think many of us in our personal or business lives uh, live easily with unpaid, uh, you know, with unpaid uh, uh, payables to government and the like. So I think this is really a stark reflection on just how challenging the circumstance is for the many, many people that have invested everything that they have in this industry. I've got a little more data as well. Yeah, please. Thanks, George, and thanks, David. And we can acknowledge that this is already happening right now. Over half of all CCAA filings in Canada in the last six months, in the first six months of 2022, were from the cannabis industry. So this is already going on. Stanford Craft did a survey that was updated in March of 2022, where 60% of respondents, a subset of 40 small to medium enterprises and micros, 60% of those businesses suggested that they did not have 12 months of runway left. So this is nothing short of an emergency in small business in Canadian cannabis. Do you have a follow-up, David? I do not. Thank you. And uh, this concludes the press conference. This is my final conference. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so very much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>